Evan Clark, Israel Gutierrez, Harry Lyles Jr., and making her around the horn debut, Jen Lada. Huzzah! There we go. Today, game three. And three games going the wrong way for the eight. And we'll remember the great Jerry West. Around the horn. Jen Latta comes to us from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Radio for ESPN Milwaukee. Dominating Gabe and Chewy on Jen, Cave and Chewy. And a little TV <laughs> show called College Game Day. I believe you're familiar. College Football Live. Previously, Comcast, Sportsnet, Chicago, Marquette University Forge. Jen, you got seven seconds. Give us your life story. Start at the beginning. Leave nothing out. I'll give you seven words, and it is a lyric from one of my favorite Billy Joel songs. It is, you may be right, Tony. I may be crazy. <laughs> I think you're going to figure out that's a great way to start this show. There it is, your first mute. Let's go around the horn. And let's get right in there. Game three tonight, Maverick Celtics. We all failed the biology class of Chris Stapp's Porzingis' injury. Not sure if it's a hangnail or terminal, but I do know he's listed as questionable on the injury report for tonight. Other side of the court, Dallas. Adjustments to make after falling down 0-2. Talking strategy. We're just talking about getting back home and getting right. We'll go around the horn to the rookie. Jen, you're going to start us off. The number one thing the Mavericks need to go their way tonight to make this a win and a series. Well, Tony, I don't mean to be disrespectful to the Mavs, but I'm not sure I know of something they can do to make this a series because you need them to play their I'll very best game the of the front. playoffs. Yes. I'm talking about Western Conference Finals Game 5 when Kyrie and Luka each had 36 points. Their defensive rotations have been terrible. They've been undisciplined. And Luka, I know he's dealing with injuries on his head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Not exactly that, but you get the ch children's <laughs> song. And he is doing the very best he can out there offensively. But defensively, he is still a liability. They cannot hide him, and I'm not willing to excuse the eight turnovers he had, double his regular season average, which actually led the league, and led to a number of double-digit points for the Boston Celtics. Boston is too deep. This feels inevitable like Thanos, and this is why Michael Finley took the beer out of the hand of Luka after they won the Western <laughs> Conference Finals because he knew how tough of a task this was going to be for the Mavericks, and he didn't think that he should be celebrating that Oh, my that goodness. Season. Rest the panel. I believe you are in trouble right now. Incredible start from the rookie. Harry Lyles Jr., number one thing Dallas needs to do tonight to turn it around. Yeah, I'm going to try to find a path for them because uh, I would like to see more basketball. And it's got to start with Chris Stapp's Porzingis. He has been the biggest X factor in this series. The Celtics are plus 32 in the 44 minutes that he's on the floor. Mm -hmm. They're an even zero with in the 52 minutes that he's off okay. the floor. It doesn't sound so like you're making a Dallas point to what right now. Doing. It sounds like you're making a Celtics so, point. So, mm -hmm. so, so you need him. You need to get him off of the floor or at least hope that this injury is going to hamper him in some type of way because there's two things that the Mavericks have not been able to do in this series that they did well throughout the playoffs that made them the Western Conference champion. One was getting the lob plays in the offense. They had 54 of them coming into the finals. The team with the second most had just nine. They only have two so far in this mm. series. They also have to get downhill. Kyrie Irving is your second best player. He has not been playing like it. You're going up against a 64-win conference champion. You're not going to beat them if he does not play that way. He has not had an easy time at the rim. He needs to be able to do that tonight. Mm. Otherwise, they have absolutely no shot. And none of this is going to be easy for the Mavericks because even without Porzingis, the Celtics are still 9-1 and one this postseason, and they've won eight consecutive games on the road, even going back to the year before. All right. So lobs, though, and getting Kyrie Irving downhill. That's the adjustment Dallas needs to make, according to Lyles. Israel, I'll bring you in here on the number one adjustment. Dallas. To me, it's pretty much all defense and shot making for this team because I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago during a Heat uh, Sixers 
playoff series where there was a young man on Twitter who confirmed that Doc Rivers was not cooking anything up in that huddle during a timeout. In that same vein, I don't think Jason Kidd really has a whole lot of answers in between games. I don't really have faith that he is going to find an answer for what Drew Holiday is doing, you know, in the dunker spot over there on the baseline on offense. And when people come and help, he's got an easy bucket. I don't think Jason Kidd is going to be able to answer that. So I think it really just becomes a matter of defense. And we talked, you know, you've seen the clips online of Luka, but it's just everybody who's playing maybe questionable defense, you know. And then we talk about the shot making. P.J. Washington has been a consistent shot maker this entire postseason. Is not making anything yet. He needs to be there. And Kyrie Irving, of course, he said it. I'm letting Luca down. The last time we saw it in reverse where Luca said, hey, I'm letting Kyrie down, Luca really stepped up and had a run. We'll see if Kyrie can do that. I don't know if he can have the same effect that he has in previous series defensively because, you know, the Celtics don't really have smallish guys that he can guard. Jalen Brown can bully him. Everybody else on that team that scores can kind of bully him. So he's going to have to score and hit at least three or four three-pointers to keep this game. And now Kevin Clark, the adjustment down. Dallas needs to make to give us a series. I see a path, guys. I see a path on popular okay. opinion. But it's two-pronged, okay? The first part is, obviously, Kyrie Irving has to play better, although 17 of his 18 shots this series have been contested. We have to give, obviously, the Celtics some credit for mm -hmm. that. But you have to make Porzingis' injury matter. In the regular season, Porzingis was the best paint defender in basketball uh, around the basket. And I, I really don't think uh, you, you can kind of adjust that overnight. But listen. On the offensive side of the ball, having a non-shooter on the floor, which is what's going to happen if the Celtics are without Porzingis, you're going to have a situation where Dallas can collapse the paint a little bit. They're going to get to uh, have more maybe action inside. I think really there's a path here. Porzingis is a difference maker, and it will make a difference if he's out. Okay. You seem to be the panelist who's willing to say there's a chance. Do I gut that you're picking Dallas tonight, Kevin Clark? They win tonight. Israel Gutierrez? I'll take Dallas to make it interesting. Harry Lyles Jr. Dallas. And Jen Latta, your first pick now on Around the Horde. No, I think the Celtics yeah, win I this thought game. you might they say that Thanos after your hot fire everything. answer. All right. <laughs> Remember, the picks you make equal the points you get your next show or the mutes you take. We'll move on. Lynx 100, Aces 86 last night. Champs on a losing streak. First time in five years they've lost three straight. They're 5-5 five and five on the season at the quarter pole mark of the year. What Minnesota did to them in the last three quarters was methodical. Lynx have had a great start. Jen, back to you. What is not clicking with the Aces right now? And do you see it as a little problem, maybe a bigger problem, or no problem at all? The things that aren't clicking with the Aces don't worry me. I see them as a little problem, and here's why. One, the Lynx, who they played last night, are really good. They're actually the best three-point shooting team in the mm -hmm. league at about a 40% clip. They've got great chemistry. They like playing well together. They like playing together, and they're playing well together. And so the issues that I see that the Aces are having are numerous, but not so concerning. Here's why. Sometimes in one of the losses, they've only got five this year, but in one of the losses, it was bad defense. In another one of the losses, it was that the bench didn't come through. In another one of the losses, it's that was the players behind Asia Wilson didn't come through. To me, that means you're playing with your food. It's not one thing that is like an Achilles heel of the team that is going to uh, contribute to your downfall. I also think they're being compared to their standard from last year. They didn't get their fifth loss until August, right? Just because they have fifth, five losses now doesn't mean this team that has won back-to-back -back championships in the W doesn't know what to do in crunch time. They'll get it mm -hmm. figured out. Kevin Clark, around the horn to you. Do you see something in the Aces this year that you think is a little problem or no problem whatsoever? As an NFL reporter, I've done far too many what's wrong with the Chiefs segments to bite on a segment like this and say <laughs> something is really wrong with the Aces. Okay. Uh, Wilson has had a historically good first 10 games from a scoring perspective, from a rebounding perspective. We're seeing MVP-level numbers. If there's anything to circle, it's the defense. They've given up over 90 points mm -hmm. in the last three okay. games. It was, uh, it was around 80 in the, in the previous games before that. So if I'm, if I'm circling something, it's that. But listen, championship teams have to find their identity every single year. And so I'm not here to say oh, of course they're going to win the championship. This is about finding out who you are over the course of the season. I default to thinking that they can do it, so this will be fine. Mm -hmm. Israel Gutierrez, what are you seeing specifically with the aces and the losing streak they're on? 
Well, yes, Jen, Minnesota's good, but the Aces have been the best team in this league for a couple of years now. So when you start to see slipping like this, yeah, there is some concern. Pr pr primarily for me, it's defensively, especially the last couple of games. The last game, giving up 55% shooting from the field, even better from three-point range. I know the Minnesota's a really good three-point shooting team, but the previous game against L.A., uh, almost 50% again and just fouling way too much. So that needs to tighten up. But honestly, can we talk about Chelsea Gray missing? Like, this is a big uh, 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 void here. You've got your point guard. You've got your leading assist person. You've got somebody that can put the pressure on the defense and more regularly sort of bring variety to the offense and not just dump it into Asia to go to work all the time. So I think when you get her back probably in sometime in July, you'll probably see the actual version of the Aces. Chelsea Gray's injury, and she's the best point guard in the league, happened in the middle of the WNBA Finals. They still were able to go on the road and win at the Liberty in the decisive game, but you're right, they've missed her all season. Israel gets a point for that. Harry Lowes Jr. on the one thing you're seeing from the Aces this year. Yeah, Tony, this is about who has not been on the floor, and it is Chelsea Gray because she is the best guard in women's basketball. And when we look at this three-game losing streak, uh, Jackie Young did not play against the Sparks, which I think you could attribute that uh, as to that one, and she really didn't look 100% yesterday. But to also give some context to just how great the Aces are and why this three-game losing streak is shocking, out of the rest of the 11 teams in the WNBA, there have been 117 losing streaks of three or more games, and each team has done that four times. The only team that has been this dominant in WNBA history were the Houston Comics going back to literally right. the beginning of the league. So for this team, it's literally just about who's not there. They'll get healthy. They'll be And okay. there are a lot of losing streaks, but something else should be said. The rest of the league has gotten better. We've seen the jump Minnesota has made this year, and Connecticut has looked as good as anybody. And you know the Liberty haven't gone anywhere as well. League getting tighter at the top. We've been horn. One more story here. We remember the life of Jerry West. His passing today at 86 years of age announced memorials and tributes, and now a profound realization from basketball fans everywhere. Maybe the greatest full career of anyone ever in the game. Mr. Clutch on the court. The breakthrough championship, Lakers over Knicks, when the Lakers seem to be unable to get over that hump. One of the greatest shots in history, a 60-footer to send the Lakers to overtime in a finals game. And the architect of the Showtime Lakers. If that's not enough, any debate over how massive an impact Jerry West had over the game ends with two words. The logo. That silhouette. The story is it was sketched from a photo an artist liked. Never asked West. West <laughs> never agreed to it, but of course, I'm sure you could say he admired it over years. Over the years, he has admitted you could change it to Jordan, you could change it to Kobe. No change has come. A simple image of excellence. We remember the great Jerry West. Welcome back to Around the Horn, coming to you from the Heineken River Deck at Pier 17. First time through the lineup, well, rookie was money. But everybody has a plan until golf is buy or sell number one. Let's go around the horn. U.S. Open preview. Rory says he's close. Tiger says he's strong. Rom says he's out. And now we talk Scotty Scheffler. We haven't seen odds like this since Tiger Woods in 2009. We haven't seen a five-win season going into this tournament since Tom Watson in 1980. Kevin Clark, around the horn to you. Is Scotty Scheffler as big as a short thing as Tiger Woods was in his glory days in this year's Open? Yes, he is. As the only panelist who has played Pinehurst number two this Whoa. year, by the way, if any pros oh my goodness. need advice oh, how does he do on it? how to shoot 93 on number two, my DMs are open. <laughs> I got all sorts of advice playing out of waste areas, playing out of pine straw. But here's the thing about Scotty Scheffler, if you don't follow golf, he controls the golf ball with approach shots better than basically anybody since Tiger 20 years ago. Approach shots are the deodorant of golf. They make everything better off the tee or short game, but he's pretty good at that stuff too. But he's, he's doing stuff you're not supposed to be able to do with a golf ball. And that's why week to week he is contending. And you want to talk about uh, you know, winning majors. Arnold Palmer was the last guy to have five wins and a major going into the U.S. Open. That was nice. So you think he's a sure thing as anything, although your answer was just as much on you as it was Scotty Scheffler. Is there a good Gutierrez to you? 
Kevin, I prefer the more physically demanding sports. I'll get into golf in my 50s. But uh, no, Scotty <laughs> Scheffler, he should be the favorite, but not quite Tiger Woods type favorite. He hasn't been facing the live guys every single week. Uh, uh, Xander Shoffley's been playing great. Morikawa can still give him a go. So he shouldn't be the runaway, absolute, sure thing favorite, but he should definitely be the favorite. Howard that was point. Junior? I, I'll give him him versus the field, and, and I would take him because the thing with golf is these guys, at least when we talk about what Tiger Woods was, he was an outlier among his peers, and Scotty Scheffler is that right now. He is one of four golfers to have five wins before the end of June in the last 60 years. So he is doing something that is unprecedented. He is, has control of the ball in a way that other players don't. He is playing the best golf. He is that outlier. I would and take him. And Ladda, around the horn to you. Okay, I'll say to you what I say to my kids every time we get in the car. We're almost there, but we're not there yet. So I am selling this idea of him compared to Tiger Woods. He's won five of eight. Tiger won six in a row back in 2000 and reached nine. I believe three of those were majors. So I think he's getting closer to being in the Tiger Woods conversation, but Scheffler is not yeah, and there that's yet. funny. It's the same thing I say to Kevin Clark every show. We're almost there, but we're not there yet. We'll move on. Buy or sell two. Connor Hughes, SNY. The Jets don't think it's a big deal. All right. You might think that might be the end of the story. Is it with Aaron Rodgers known but unexcused absence? Let's see. What do you buy? What do you sell today? Around the horn, Jen Latta. Okay, well, the snarky part of me wants to say that this is Aaron Rodgers following through on his comments earlier in the year about getting rid of all non-football distractions. But the practical part of me is buying Rodgers if he wants to be miffed or frustrated or disappointed about the way the Jets have handled this. Robert Sala told us that he was in communications with Rodgers. By all accounts, he knew that his quarterback was not going to be here for quote-unquote mandatory minicamp. He probably knows where in the world Carmen Sandiego is right now. So I don't understand him then not taking the choice, and it is a choice. Here in Green Bay, we've got three high-level defensive players who have been excused from mandatory minicamp and not saying, yes, you're All right, we're here. Now, save the rest for the 30 for 30 you're doing on this. Uh, Harry Lyles Jr., please. <laughs> I think that it is a big deal. I'm going to buy that it is that because uh, if you have to say that it's not, it probably is. Like Aaron Rodgers is probably going to be okay without this mandatory minicamp. Uh, but it's clear that the organization is perhaps not happy about it because we are having this conversation about it. The uh, absence that I think is more notable in this instance is Hassan Reddick. You traded for a guy who was happy in Philadelphia, wanted to be there, he just wanted an extension, you trade for him, and then you don't do the one thing that everybody does when you immediately trade for a guy like that and give him that extension. The Jets are a mess. Gutierrez. It's so not a big deal, they don't even have to come up with an excuse. They're just telling you the truth. He doesn't want to be there, he's got something else to do. Not going to be a big factor in his long-term situation, especially coming off this injury, probably needs less reps than ever. Yeah, I don't think it's a big deal. And Kevin Clark. Medium deal. First of all, I like the idea that, oh, this has been pre-planned for months. Deal. Guys, mandatory minicamp has been either the first or the second week of June for about 40 years. So I think we knew exactly when that was going to happen. But here's the deal. 2021, Aaron Rodgers didn't like the situation. He skipped mandatory minicamp. He won the MVP that year. The difference is that Matt LaFleur refused to engage with the media. He didn't really say whether or not it was excused or unexcused. We know it was unexcused. But Robert Sala mishandled this a little bit. Nothing in June really determines what happens in September. So this is a medium deal at best unless something crazy uh, comes out in the next couple days extra medium extra medium rare deal oh my goodness kevin i say again we're almost there but we're not there yet not so down <laughs> for kevin clark that's it for him israel gutierrez as well we'll say goodbye and there it is look at this around the horn game day the rookie jen lada in her debut in showdown versus harry lyles jr next NFL camps, here's Travis Kelsey. I, uh, I'm going to do it till the wheels fall off, and hopefully uh, that doesn't happen anytime soon. And here's Joe Burrow. You know, whenever the injuries start to stack up, it's your football mortality kind of comes into the back of your mind. Both thinking about the future, but thinking about it differently. Jen Latta, Harry Lyles Jr., welcome to Showdown. Jen, which comment stood out to you? It's the Kelsey comments for me. While I appreciate the candor of Joe. Jen Latta, Harry Lyles Jr., welcome to Showdown. Jen, which comments stood out to you? Which comments stood out to you? 
It's the Kelsey comments for me. While I appreciate the candor of Joe Burrow, Kelsey's are more reflective and representative of how the league actually feels. These guys don't want to quit playing. It's why so many of them struggle at the end of their careers. They recognize that they've won the genetic lottery. It is a get-to job, not a have-to job. He is more relatable Harry by Wiles NFL Jr. players. That is true, Jen, but I do love the maturity from Joe Burrow's answer because while a lot of the stories that people love about sports is fighting through injuries and things like that, Will Street obviously comes to mind. I think having this sort of mentality is hopefully going to get Joe Burrow not just healthy, but also lead to a long career for him. And obviously, we'd all like to see that because he's one of the best quarterbacks in the he NFL. He looked like he healthy. beefed up a little bit too, right? Burrow did? Jen, mm -hmm. you said you liked Burrow's candor. Then you lot a lot a lot it over the best part, and you chose the Kelsey. Point <laughs> to Lyle. Showdown 2, the latest on... Nathan's versus Chestnut. No update. We don't have the latest. But as of now, Chestnut, the 16-time winner of the contest, not going to compete. This is a food fight that gets to the very ingredients of it all. Harry, who you got? Nathan's or Joey Chestnut? Tony, I'm going with jo Tony, uh, Joey Chestnut because there's one very easy solution here. Obviously, this has to do with sponsors. They need to make their own challenge. Have impossible hot dog contest eating or competition, excuse me. Make it like live golf. He can't lose in this. Ooh, ooh that's, that's the comparison you want to make here? Jen, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I am all on the uh, Joey Chestnut side as well. Is this a Venn diagram that actually has a portion in the middle that meets? I feel like people who eat Nathan's hot dogs are not people who are eat eating impossible uh, foods. So to me, this is something that they don't need to be worried about. It goes to Joey Chestnut. Mm -hmm. The rookie getting the win in her first appearance. Congratulations, Jen Latta. 30 seconds of face time. Just clunking my way through that one. This Sunday on SportsCenter, we are telling the story of Ellie Breach. She's the goalkeeper for the Pittsburgh women's soccer team who saved her dad's life with CPR when he went into sudden cardiac arrest on Christmas morning. Just another reminder of how important it is to learn these life-saving techniques. It's a great story for Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to everybody out there, and happy Father's Day to you, Tony. Thank you very much, Jen. Wow. There it is. Win number one for Jen Latta. Do not be a stranger. Come back to us, Jen. Incredible debut. Thanks to you all. We'll see you tomorrow around the horn.